Okay, so this talk is pandas from the inside. I think probably quite a few of you were at um, Alexander's talk before, um, an introduction to pandas. This talk goes much more on the internals of how pandas works, so we can see exactly why it's memory efficient and fast, and so that will help us write uh, code using pandas that is efficient. Now, first of all, just to introduce myself, uh, I work at JP Morgan, uh, an American bank in London. Uh, I'm um, um, a full-time Python developer. Uh, currently, I am what's called a, a front office developer. I run technology for trading um, gold, silver, platinum, and palladium in the commodities business. And I'm about to move to the equities trading part of the bank, uh, where I'm uh, leading a new team on data and analytics engineering. And Python and Pandas will play a big part in the tooling that we will use there. So um, first of all, for those that have just come in, the um, slides have a fair amount of detail on them. And you'll get the most out of this if you can download the PDFs of the slides from my GitHub repo and follow along as we go. The link to the GitHub repo is also in my description of the talk uh, on the um, conference schedule. So the goals for today is to look a bit at the foundations of pandas as built on um, a combination of Python and NumPy, and also the um, uh, data frame aspects of R. And we will do a relatively simple piece of analysis. The, the topic is going to be sports statistics. The analysis is not very complicated, but we're going to look quite deeply into it to see exactly what's uh, going on uh, underneath the, the surface syntax. So we'll look at data frames, slicing data frames, how indexes work, and doing group buys. All the standard things that we do when we are doing analysis using pandas. We'll understand a bit more about how the syntax works, what's going on. We'll see which operations are fast, which operations are slow. Some of them are very unexpectedly fast or slow. And we'll understand why exactly that is. This will help give us a good intuition for, for how um, Pandas works, and so that we can then um, still write code that will work efficiently and effectively as we scale up to bigger and bigger problems. Now, this part of the talk will take about an hour, and then the last half hour, we'll look at um, something that I've called Big Pandas, which is using a library called Dask to do distributed data frame calculations. Now, I think probably um, many of the people here that have been um, doing scientific programming with Python will know about um, NumPy and uh, that th that's used to um, get high performance through um, Python operations and efficient memory usage. And we'll just look a bit at the difference quickly between um, Python and NumPy to see why that is. On the left side here is a representation of a, a normal Python list of uh, a 1,000 elements. And the, the actual list itself is made up of pointers to, oh, uh, let's go back, pointers to each of the elements. And then each of the elements themselves, uh, a number, is a Python object. And these Python objects are shown with, uh, in a box with a little head thing attached to them, which is what um, makes them a, a real Python object. Now, on the right-hand side, the uh, NumPy version of this, we, we create it, um, in this case, for integers uh, by using that a range function. The, the, um, the shape of the uh, NumPy equivalent is quite a lot simpler. We have the same sort of 
um, pointer to describe the, uh, the array of data, but then the actual data itself is, you can think of it as just being one contiguous block. So whereas in the Python case, we had a thousand different elements, all of them as individual objects with um, types and a reference count and everything else that Python needs to work, um, <clears throat> on the NumPy side, that's much simpler. Now, uh, to understand the memory usage differences of these, um, we can define a function uh, for shorthand, GSO um, to get the size of uh, get the size of an object in Python, and we can see for various types of plain Python lists the um, relevant sizes. So an uh, integer itself is 24 bytes, an empty list 64 bytes. Uh, in our list of a thousand elements, we need to take both the uh, list structure itself plus the elements in the list, and that gives us a total of 37,000 bytes for, for an array uh, list in Python that has 1,000 elements. In NumPy, if we do the same thing, we define these as four-bit integers, and uh, we can pull out some parameters for the, the structure of this array um, from, from the NumPy object, and its full size is 4,000 bytes. So you can see straight away by using a NumPy array rather than a Python object for representing the same data, we have used uh, um, one eighth the amount of memory. So that, that shows that NumPy is far more efficient than, uh, than Python when we are representing uh, objects of homogeneous data. Now, size in bytes is one thing. Uh, another thing that matters when we are doing processing in, in pandas on, on uh, large amounts of data is how fast it is. And we'll start just now with, with comparing the speed of, of Python and NumPy and then see how that gets used in, in pandas. If we are taking a, a list of elements in Python and uh, add them up, it takes 10 milliseconds. Maybe you think that's fast, maybe you think it's slow. Probably if you're used to programming in Go or, or C++ or something, you think it's very slow, but 10 milliseconds is what it is. Uh, if we do the same thing in NumPy, then it takes a tenth of that time, uh, and that's calling the, the NumPy native function sum on the array. If we do it in a rather naive way, of calling the, Nathan, uh, the, the native um, Python function on the array, it actually takes 15 times longer than, than plain Python. And the reason for that is that in order to sum all of the elements of the array, Python um, needs to pull out the four bytes of memory from NumPy and then wrap it into a um, normal Python integer object and uh, attach the reference count and object type to it. And then it sums it all up and then discards it. So it's very inefficient uh, and it's quite slow. But you'll see the difference here is more than a factor of 100. And this is a theme that we're going to come back to several times during this talk with pandas, where if you do things the right way, it will be super fast. If you do things a slightly ineffective way, maybe a dumb way you could describe it, then it will be 100 times slower, and we don't want that. Now, if we extend our picture of the data to two dimensions, then uh, the, the kind of picture you might draw in, in Python is of a list of, uh, have a list of lists. For NumPy, it's actually uh, much simpler. Uh, we just have one contiguous uh, array of data, and the description of the array um, uh, just points to the start of that. Now, uh, that's uh, shown just here. If we want to, we can reshape this array. Um, so this is what a one-dimensional array. We can reshape it into a two-dimensional array here, 
And what we actually get is a new header uh, describing that array, um, but it's pointing to the same data. So we've effectively created a new array, but doing zero copying of, of the underlying data, and that's sufficient. And we'll see over and over again that NumPy tries to do, oh, sorry, the, the pandas tries to uh, do this type of thing. To see how um, this actually works in NumPy, uh, we can take our original array and the second array, and then um, maybe also create a third one here by taking every, every third element. So in this slice syntax here, we start at the third element, uh, we go to the end, and we take every third one. And then we can look at uh, the info function uh, on these arrays in NumPy, and it will tell us various things about them. So we can see that for the, the three arrays, they have quite different shapes because of the way they've been defined. 24 elements in, in one dimension, three by eight in the second, or, or something with seven elements in uh, just one dimension for, for this third one. Um, for uh, the contiguous flag says whether these, the elements are um, next to one another in memory or not. And you can see where we have jumped through every, every third element uh, that's flipped from true to false. The, the data pointer for the info, uh, you can see how the first two arrays are actually using the same data in memory. So by creating that, uh, that array, it, was, um, it didn't have to copy the data, just create the new array header structure. Um, so that was very fast. In the case of the third array, then it didn't copy the data, but instead the pointer is to the uh, fourth element in the array, or the third element in the array, sorry. Um, and, and so creating all of these is fast. Now, the next thing that we're going to uh, need to bring from NumPy into pandas is uh, a number of different expressions for indexing. Um, maybe I should ask, who here has, has used NumPy for scientific type calculations? Okay, so roughly about half of people, so, so you know what I'm talking about here. So these expressions for indexing NumPy arrays should be very familiar to you, even if you don't know NumPy because they're modeled on the standard syntax for slicing a, a list in Python. We can, we can pull out a, a um, single object um, or a single row from a two-dimensional array for using a scalar index. Uh, so we pull out a whole row. We can take a, a slice with a subset of columns here. Uh, we can pass in a, a set of row integers, or a list of integers here, which are used to pull out um, specific uh, columns from here, the, the first, fifth, and, and seventh columns. Uh, and that's actually equivalent to the take function here. When we come to look at indexing in pandas, we'll see that what pandas is doing on the underlying data in a pandas data frame is effectively this take operation. Um, we can be a bit more sophisticated about how we specify that. We can use a Boolean function like this uh, to pull out the rows where the Boolean function is true. And uh, we could also use this on the left-hand side of an expression to assign a value back into the matching elements of the array. And, and we'll see that this works uh, exactly the same kind of way in pandas. So basically, that's all we need to, uh, to take from, uh, from NumPy to, uh, to understand the basis of, of pandas. Uh, but now we're going to look at how it's all put together to create the, the overall package that, uh, that makes pandas so easy to use and is the reason why it's, it's become so popular. So pandas has now um, 
uh, about, um, about eight years old, I think, um, eight or ten years old, um, and was originally developed uh, for use in a hedge fund. So Wes McKinney designed it in a hedge fund called AQR for doing a lot of the type of analysis that you need for doing financial calculations, um, a lot like uh, the, the ease of, um, of summarizing data that you, you might get in Excel or you might get in R. It uh, has the easy syntax that Python has. Um, but also brings together the much faster calculations, speed, and, and memory efficiency of, of NumPy. Now, when we uh, look at pandas, if we go to, um, go to the pandas package, open a, a Python command line, and do a, a import pandas uh, as PD, the, the normal way of um, importing pandas, and if we then do a, a dot, if say if we're in um, a, a IPython notebook or in Jupyter, and then hit tab to tab complete it, we'll get a list of a whole lot of classes and methods. So here are some of the top level classes uh, in pandas. The, the three at the top, data frame series, time series, you'll use uh, all the time in your everyday, uh, everyday analysis. There's a number of types of index that you'll be using. You just may not uh, realize that you're using them explicitly. Uh, and then as we sort of get further down this list, we get to uh, more and more uh, specialized types of classes that you, you won't really know about. If we go deep into the internal of uh, pandas, then we'll see things like block managers and join units and uh, blocks and things like that. So who here has heard of a block manager? OK, well, we'll be covering uh, block managers, so this will be new to everyone. Uh, as well as all of these uh, in internal um, classes inside NumPy. We also have a lot of functions, uh, a lot of methods on all of these classes. So one of the design philosophies of pandas at the start was to make everything easily discoverable. So all, all the functionality is there at the top level of the objects. Do uh, pandas dot, uh, data frame dot and hit tab, and you'll get something like 425 methods. And it can be very hard as a beginner to pandas to really know where do you start. There are so many different ways of doing things. Well, first of all, there are so many things you can do. Then for each of them, there are several generations of APIs that have been used. Some of them are closer to NumPy, some of them are um, more high level, and uh, the functionality is really, really broad. So it can be, be quite intimidating uh, trying to figure out exactly what you, you need to do. Uh, one of the aims of uh, this tutorial is to help you navigate through the parts of that that you, really, uh, that you really do need. One of the consequences of all of uh, this, this very big namespace for pandas, and, and I think it's about 200,000 lines of code at the moment, is that it, it gives you a lot of functionality. Most things that you want to do, you can do in a few lines in pandas. The problem is it's not always obvious which few lines of pandas you need to do that, and you can spend a very, very long time trying to figure that out. And certainly I found when I started using pandas that it felt at the beginning the learning curve was really steep, steep in the good sense in that within a small amount of time, you can actually accomplish quite a lot. But after that, it felt like it wasn't so smooth. And in, in some ways, it felt like the more that I learned about pandas, the less I was able to accomplish, where I'd be able to do certain things quite easily. And then the one next thing from that that feels like it should be really easy. Turns out to be impossible. You know, indexes don't join, or you get these weird warnings. And, and so then you, you perhaps start to lose faith with it and say, maybe I'll be better switching my analysis back to plain, plain Python. Maybe you persist, and you actually figure out how it works, and you move to the next stage. 
and, um, and, and so it keeps going. So Pandas is evolving rapidly, things are, are changing a lot, um, new functionality is always being added, and there's now talk of um, producing a, a Pandas version 2 that will simplify a lot of this historical um, detail and make it easier both for users and for people building libraries using pandas. But the end result is this is a bumpy learning curve and hopefully today we will help smooth out some of these bumps that occur around about here. Now when we do a, a typical piece of analysis in pandas the, the steps tend to be very much the same. You want to load the, the data that you've got into, uh, into data frames. You then want to reformat the rows and the columns so it looks a little bit nicer, add some indexes. Then we'll select a subset of the rows, do, do an aggregation uh, using group by, and then we'll display it using some kind of visualization library so that it looks good, and then maybe compare it with other data. These steps are very standard, so uh, we will now uh, apply that uh, in a uh, domain that sporting statistics. Now, how many people here have seen Australian rules football? One, two, three. Okay. <laughs> so that's three people out of about, I guess, uh, 120. I'm Australian. Uh, I'm from Melbourne, which is where Australian rules football started in 1897. And um, so that's why I'm, I'm using this as the uh, example for the talk. I guess the other reason is I work for a bank. The bank is very protective about intellectual property. I don't want to do anything that involves financial data um, because then I'll get a lot of questions from uh, people inside about what actually you're saying. So sports statistics is okay. Now, what you're used to calling football is what I call soccer, and I look at the scores of a soccer game and I think they're so low, they're boring. These are typical scores in an uh, Aussie rules football game. We call it football or footy. Uh, so a, a typical score is you know, maybe 70 to 120, maybe 140 points. The, uh, the score is calculated, is actually always shown as three numbers. The first number is the number of goals. The second number is the number of points. And the total is you get six points for each goal and then one for each behind. And uh, there's a, um, a data set that has every football game that's been played since the start of the competition in Melbourne in 1897. And as of a year ago, uh, it had 14,000 games. So the, the data set that we're going to use is a plain text file like this. Often when we use pandas, we start off with data that's a nice CSV file with commas and we can just load it straight in. Uh, this needs a little bit more work. We've got multiple col columns for sure. We don't have commas between them. We have spaces between columns, but we also have spaces within columns. And we have dots here and we also have uh, dots there to maybe confuse things. Now, the difference between goals and behinds, uh, this, is, this is what the goal end of a Aussie rules um, oval looks like. The, the, the playing ground is called an oval because it's an, an oval shape. And uh, there are four goals here. If the ball goes between the middle two goals, you get six points. If it goes between the, the outer goal post and then the, the middle one, you get one point. And if it bounces off the middle one and uh, goes in, then you get one point. And uh, there's a goal line uh, umpire there who will have a couple of, uh, used to be flags in his hand to wave when you get a, a goal, two flags or one flag or uh, behind. Um, and then here are the players. And the game involves a lot of running and jumping. You can catch the ball, you can kick the ball, uh, you can push off um, people's shoulders to catch it, and there are 18 players aside. Yep. What is it behind? 
The behind is where the ball goes um, between the, the highest goalpost and the next one, so when it goes in there, so you get one point. I have a video that may or may not work. <laughs> let's, let's see how this goes. I think this will be without the sound. Um, but this, this just shows you uh, how they actually play and run and jump and tackle one another. Uh, they pass the ball with a handball, or you can run with it and bounce it, and then he's just kicked it about 50 metres into the goal. Um, you see that the scores here are 87-88 between Essendon and Collingwood, and it's the fourth quarter, and it's just gone over um, the end of time for that quarter. So it was a very, very exciting finish to that match. And everyone is very happy, and so there's the, there's the umpire showing that he got the goal and then just repeating that kick. So this is in a stadium that holds 110,000 people. So uh, that's, that's the Melbourne football ground. OK, so this is Aussie rules. Now, um, so that's why I think that soccer is a bit boring. There's a lot more action in Aussie rules. Now, from, from this data that we start with, we want to end up with what's called a premiership ladder, and basically it's uh, a list of the, the rankings of the teams from the um, number of points they get um, for uh, four points for a win, uh, two for a draw, and none for a loss, uh, and then also rank them by percentages for goals um, for and against. Um, so that's what we want to end up with. To start with, we'll load the data into a, a um, pandas data frame, and we can do this with the read CSV function. Um, because this, this text is not pure CSV, we can use some other um, of the settings here to actually parse it in. And uh, surprisingly enough, uh, we can uh, use a regular expression as a separator here. Um, most people don't know you can do that, but if you have tricky data, you can use a regular expression. You need to use the Python engine for that. Um, and um, so, yeah, we load it up, and it looks like this. So here, uh, for, the, for the next few slides, when I draw pandas data frames, I'm going to show the body of the data in green, uh, the column index in yellow, the red for the row index. Um, if we pull out these individual pieces, we can see some of these objects, or some of these classes uh, alluded to before. So there's uh, the index here is a, for the rows is a range index. Um, we don't have to store the individual numbers for the index. That's, it's a bit like a slice. Uh, the column index is, is just the names um, of, of the columns. Um, and we can actually get the values in green by doing dot values here, and we get back, uh, in this case, a, a numpy rec array of, of all of the values there, um, and these are converted to timestamps. So that looks, that looks really neat and really simple, um, and uh, let's actually see uh, how fast some of these operations are. The difference in speeds here give us a clue of what's happening underneath. Now, um, to get the, the values for the array, the, the, the data values here, it took 35 milliseconds, which is actually really, really slow, and we'll see, we'll see why that is in a moment. Um, to get two columns from the array, is taking 500 microseconds. So um, that's uh, 70 times faster. So, and that, that returns a pandas data frame. Um, if we just get those two columns individually, it's actually just taking uh, two uh, microseconds per column. And so you can see that here, extracting a, a series from a data frame is really, really fast. Um, here, we're extracting two of them from the data frame, and that's uh, surprisingly um, a lot slower. I used to think that keeping things as a data frame was the way to go if you wanted speed, thinking somehow it was all packed together more neatly. 
but actually operating on individual columns which are pulled out as a series is, is super fast. Here, if we take just one column, we can, we can pull out that column as a series, or we can pull it out as a data frame by taking an array of column names, and you see that those differ by a factor of 240 in how fast they are. So, so there's, there's a, something is going on here to make it actually take more time to, to extract that. And we'll, we'll see why that might be. So this is, this is where we, it comes into play this thing called the block manager that no one had heard of. Now, uh, if, we go, if we go back here, when we got the values of the array, we got back a numpy rec array. And the reason why this is a rec array is that these all have different types. Some of them are integers, uh, some of them are date times, and some of them are objects. So if we, if we look at the blocks that make up a data frame, then actually we can see that each block is made up of those individual data types, and they have um, uh, the underlying uh, block of homogeneous data. So from a numpy point of view, the, what we see as a pandas data frame with columns of different types is actually three different numpy arrays each of them having the same data type, three homogeneous data types. And then these labels around the block numbers and the block locations, they say how the columns in the pandas data frame relate to the columns in these blocks. So if what we're asking for is to get, say, uh, one column from the, the data frame, what pandas is actually doing is finding out which block it is, and then using a numpy slicing operation to get um, that column from the underlying numpy table. Uh, numpy is, is all coded in um, uh, C-level code, so that's very fast compared with uh, normal um, Python operations. There's a couple of other smart things that Pandas does to make things a bit faster. Uh, and one of them is uh, caching lookups of individual columns. And this is handled within the, uh, the get item, uh, double underscore get item function or method on a, on a data frame. And we can, we can see this very easily if we're in, say, IPython by doing a double question mark at the end of, um, at, at the, end of uh, the method name. Now, how many people here have used IPython? Okay, almost everyone. So you know that when you're in IPython, if you want to get help on an object, you can do a question mark at the end of it. And then if you want to do uh, get further help, which involves seeing the source code, then you can do a double question mark. I mean, this is, this is really quick and easy, especially in pandas, if you're not sure how pandas is doing something, you just get the the object you're operating on, the method that you're not sure how it works, do a double question mark, and it will show you then and there exactly what the source code is. So we can, we can look into the source code for get item, which uh, Python uses for the square bracket lookup here, and we can go through this, and um, we can see that there is some code here that seems to take a fast path. There's a, there's a cache of um, looked up columns from the data frame, and uh, so if we have already looked up one of the columns and then try and look it up again, then you'll get it back very, very quickly. And we can see this by using the time it function from an IPython command line to look up a column in a data frame. It gives us a warning that the first one is slow and the subsequent ones are fast. Uh, and we, we can look in, actually look in the cache and see it there. Um, and then if we try time it again, we see how fast the, um, the, the shows. Uh, they're all the same time looking up straight from the cache. So that's one of the things that um, uh, Pandas uses to make um, pulling out a, a series from a data frame quick. 
Um, suppose you want to select multiple data frame columns. So here we have columns um, that are different types. Uh, so what it is doing, we're saying we want uh, its uh, game number and, and the round of the competition. And so what Pandas is actually doing is getting an indexer um, on the columns, looking up the indexes, the, the numerical indexes, 0 and 2, equivalent to those names, and then doing the equivalent of a, a take, the, the underlying um, numpy take function on, um, on those columns. And uh, then it needs to add back the, the, those as a column index and then stick on the row index as well. And uh, that, uh, that gives us back this data frame. Now, um, Pandas tends to use index in a whole lot of different contexts, and it can be quite confusing what it means at any one time. When it says indexer, then that is very simply just an array of integers saying which elements uh, you should take uh, from an array. Now, if we are selecting rows, then um, it operates uh, slightly differently. Um, so if we're, if we're taking rows, then uh, what we need to do is to form a subset of the row index um, to uh, be the row index on the data frame that we return. Uh, we need to pull out the, the actual underlying data using um, or the, a reference to that data uh, using the, the take kind of operation and um, then stick back the column index on the top. If we create this new data frame here, we can see that the columns on the original and the new data frame, the column index, they are exactly the same object. So uh, Pandas hasn't had to calculate or do anything different with the columns here. It's just uh, given it a reference to that other object. So it's no new object has had to be created, so that's a very fast operation. The range index, this was a range index here because they're contiguous numbers. Here, the, the new, a new range index needed to be created, and that's just like effectively a slice with the, with the three numbers with the start and stop. So these kind of select operations, the, the operations that need to occur is look up the row and or column index to see which parts of the data frame we need to return. Uh, use the block managers to create the right subset of the data there. Um, modify the uh, um, row and column indexes if necessary, and then stick that back in a, um, in a new data frame. So uh, here are some time, timings for the different parts of uh, doing this. Um, you can see that um, if we are uh, looking up a subset of rows from the, the data frame, then uh, if we uh, use the dot values to get closer to the underlying numpy uh, objects, then taking the rows here ends up being very, very fast. Uh, and, and here, this is operating 100% on the numpy data, and that's uh, less than a microsecond. So that's a, the first stage of um, doing our analysis. We've just read in the, uh, the raw data. We've got a pandas data frame, and we can see that that data frame has a column index, a row index, and data that's made up of a block manager, where the block manager has blocks of homogeneous numpy data for each of the different data types. You had a question? Yeah. On, a, on, this one, we've got a lock. So um, lock is based lock is based on labels. Oh, sorry. Yes. Which which one of of uh, which one of these w uh, would be equivalent to lock? So lock is a, a label based lookup. 
um, and uh, um, so. So uh, uh, a lock that's looking up labels is going to be slow um, because it's got to physically use the index to see which values match, whereas something that is using iLock is using indexes into array, so it can jump right to the correct memory locations for that. So uh, anything involving iLock is going to be fast. Uh, relatively speaking, anything involving lock is going to be slower. So now we're at the, the next stage of the uh, analysis that we want to do. And this involves reformatting our data into a way that's more amenable to analysis. The, the starting point of the data is here, and we'll do a number of uh, conversions on it here to, to get it like this. Uh, I won't go into all of the details here for pulling apart these, these columns using regexes. They're quite neat, uh, so you can look at them uh, yourself. Um, but what we're doing is basically taking the left and right halves of this table and sticking it together in a, um, vertically so that we can then see it from the perspective of rather than team A playing team B, we can then have it from the perspective of a team who's playing, who their opponent is, and then the scores that are for and against them. Um, so, so here we've, we've labelled these columns for and against, if that's the score that is for the team or, or against the team. Um, so uh, let's... Uh, um, I won't go through, in the interest of time, I won't go through all of this about indexes, looking up values. Um, one uh, just quick point on using indexes to um, align uh, things when we add them up. Um, indexes, need, indexes are the way that pandas knows which rows have to go together when you are merging two objects, whether that's adding them or um, sticking columns next to one another. Uh, you can see here that if we have two series that have indexes with different values, then if we try and add them, then we have got a gap where the indexes don't match. But also see how these have changed from integers to floats. So NumPy doesn't, uh, Pandas doesn't have a way to represent missing values for integers. The way it represents missing values is with a NAN and uh, we don't have nans and integers, so that has to be a float. So the type of this column has been changed to a float. Um, in order to, um, uh, what's actually going on when this is being added is effectively a common index is being formed between the two, then the two series get re-indexed, and then you can add them up directly, element by element. Um, I won't actually go into these joins and mergers that focus on uh, multi-index. So um, uh, multi-index is where we have a multiple um, valued key uh, indexing the rows of the, uh, of the pandas array. And uh, here we have, we have set up, uh, asked it to index these four columns, and when we print it, you see that the column uh, names are shown one row higher than the multi-index names. So our index is in red, uh, these columns are in yellow, and the data itself is in green. Um, and these are shown by the columns. The index here is a multi-index, and it has names, levels, and labels. And this is effectively a, a, um, a uh, more uh, compressed way of representing that. If we want to select rows from the multi-index, we see uh, which elements, of which unique elements are here, and then can uh, look up which of the numerical uh, indexes match them here, and then bring back those rows. Uh, and that all operates very efficiently from the low-level code. Um, it's a lot like the way a categorical 
um, series is set up as well with the unique values and then an indexes saying which one to use. Now, the reason why we've uh, set it up like this is that we want to select the data from uh, a subset of, of what we have. So we want to take just one year, and the, the data that we had had the normal, what's called the normal round robin competition leading up to the finals. Then it also had preliminary finals, qualifying finals, semi-finals, and grand finals. We don't want those, so we just want the normal rounds of the competition. Um, ideally, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd just like to be able to do a multi-dimensional slice like that, and recent versions of Pandas have let you do that. Uh, there was a bug uh, a couple of versions ago where it didn't work with date values, but I think that's been fixed now. Here are four different ways we can do this, and we'll see that the times uh, for, for those uh, differ enormously. So a naive way to achieve this result would be split up the whole, um, the whole data frame um, by the, the date and, and the round uh, that is being played. And then if that's one of the ones we want to keep, then we'll put that back in our list, and then we'll concatenate them. That takes nearly a second. So what we're asking pandas to do is to take a data frame, do all of this, um, uh, selection of subsets of rows, create a whole lot of smaller data frames, and then merge them back together again. So that's a whole lot of work to do, and that's quite slow. Uh, we, can, we can do similar things, uh, achieve similar results to that, like this, by um, indexing, or here is iterating over all of the rows in the table. Now, iterating row-wise over a pandas um, data frame is something you generally don't want to do, because every row needs to then be returned as a pandas object. It gets uh, all of these operations around creating new row indexes and everything. It's, there's just a lot of overhead going on that you don't want to do, especially if you're going to ignore it straight away. So uh, don't do this, because it will be slow. Just like in NumPy, you want to uh, try and do an operation that will operate on the whole of the table together. Um, here is a, a much faster way of doing it, where we are just iterating over the index, um, where that's able to return values uh, much quicker. Um, uh, another slight variation on selecting um, the, the values in, in each of the multi-index columns, where we're doing a Boolean operation on uh, arrays of trues and false to get the values we want to return. Um, and then here, uh, doing a, a lookup on the, the values that we want to match. And that's actually the fastest by a big margin. So the moral here is, Try and use this approach because it's simpler to write with code. And wherever possible, avoid something that iterates over the rows of a data frame or that um, splits the data frame into lots of uh, sub-data frames. Now, this, uh, uh, this function we can also use on the left-hand side, just like, in, um, just like in NumPy. And so we could set a whole big chunk to zeros. Um, this explains, uh, in the interest of time, I'll just skip over this, but this is explaining how the indexing is, work, is, is working to figure out uh, what to return. Now, uh, having got the subset of data that we want to use in our analysis, we now uh, want to do some calculations around that. And in, um, we need to get the number of games played, won or drawn, so that we can end up with this championship ladder at the end. Uh, we, so we've got our data. Um, we can set the number of games played to one, and that will create uh, a new column. Uh, we get this slightly odd warning. And um, what this... Uh, what this means is that uh, Pandas is worried that 
Here we're not clear whether we are operating on the original underlying data, because it's just a slice of the underlying data, or whether we are, I want to operate on a copy of the original data frame. And if we're assigning values back into this, uh, it gives us this warning because um, we're not sure whether we mean to change the original data or not. This is, this is controlled by this flag here that says whether a data frame is a, a, a copy of another data frame, and um, we can avoid this warning by explicitly making a copy so that it's not referencing the original data frame, and then if we add that column, then um, we no longer get that warning. Now, adding that column is very fast, um, and the reason is it hasn't actually added it to the underlying um, data manager's um, integer block. It's actually cheated and created another integer block. We said we would have just one data manager block per type, whereas here we have two of, um, that are integers, and what happens is uh, Pandas tries to be lazy as you're doing column operations, but as soon as you do something that needs the whole of the table, then it does something called consolidation. Like if we're doing a max function, it consolidates the table, and then that has merged these, these blocks back together again. Um, that's why this operation seems very slow, uh, sorry, seems very fast, but that's because the slow step is this consolidation, and that actually happens as late as possible. Now, uh, we want to add the number of games uh, we've got played. We want to add one, uh, number of games one, um, and then the number of points four, um, and then the number of um, losses as well. Here are four different ways that we can try to add uh, new columns to a pandas data frame, and they're all wrong in slightly different ways. So let's quickly look at them one by one. Um, so maybe we expected to get integer values here, but they've come out as booleans. Here um, we expected to get zeros or ones, and they've come out as, as, as nans. Um, and here that has actually um, come out as zeros or ones, as we expected, using an eval function. You've probably never used an eval function in pandas, um, but that at least gets that right. So uh, this is wrong because it's the wrong data type. We need it to be integers. Um, and then for the, the draws, uh, we also then need to fill the um, NAND values where there are gaps with zeros, and then convert that back into integers. If we do all that, then we have this array that has the indicator variables where we want them. Then we can do a group by and sum them together, and that will count up the number of games won, drawn, and lost um, by each of the teams in, in the 2016 competition. Now, I said um, before that group by can be slow. Uh, where is that? Uh, anyway, there's a, a couple more slides further back. The, where, where that, with that operation involving uh, group by and the sub data frames, that took uh, 820 milliseconds. Um, here we have a group by operation that is very fast, and the reason is that NumPy knows that for, for certain types of group by operations, it doesn't need to create intermediate sub data frames. So here, we don't need to create a new data frame. If we're doing a sum, we don't have to create a, a new um, data frame for every venue and team. For sum, it can just pull out the values from the existing array and return the one number corresponding to the, the sum for each. So if we, if we do it the naive way by splitting our data frame into other data frames and then summing it and then concatenating it, that uh, uh, is very slow. Here it's 50 times faster because the sum is going directly into the underlying data. 
the uh, explanation of what's going on here is there, there's an object created um, with a, a grouper, and it keeps track of where each of the groups have their um, locations in the array. So then if you are uh, looking up a particular one of those, it can just grab those indexes directly and grab the values using the low-level NumPy operations to, uh, to sum them up. And that's, and that's very fast. Now, the final thing we need to do to, uh, to have our table ready for display is to add um, percentages and uh, points. Percentages is just a ratio of goals for and against. And there's nothing very special here. We can just uh, sort the array based on that. Um, and uh, then uh, we add an index at the start. Um, we'll add the, uh, and then, which is a position here. And so here we have uh, the published championship table. And what we've ended up with is something that looks exactly like that. So that's a very simple piece of analysis, typical of the kind of things that you'll do all of the time with, uh, with pandas. But we've seen that there are certain operations here that are uh, a factor of 100 times faster or slower than other ones. And uh, the reason for that, we now understand, is because of the way that the underlying data is stored as, as NumPy blocks. There's uh, a um, summary of all of the code here. Uh, the conclusion for this is, yeah, I mean, Pandas is great. We, we know that. That's why we're all here, because we want to use it. Um, one of the problems is that there's not just one way to do things, which is the, the sort of um, tries to, which is what Python tries to have as its philosophy. Um, but there are many, many ways to get things done, many old ways, many new ways, many bad ways, and uh, a couple of uh, normally good ways as well. And those good ways come from the core of pandas, uh, which is NumPy. So I think we now will see more about how pandas actually operates inside, how that's relatively efficient. And we've also seen some tricks to use uh, inside IPython or Jupyter Notebooks to help understand what exactly it's running. Now, this has been a simple, standalone example. It's a relatively small data set, just 14,000 rows. And uh, once we've started doing analysis on something that big or that small, then um, we'll start to ask ourselves, well, what happens if we do bigger and bigger problems? Uh, how big can um, pandas scale up? Um, I, I actually started um, writing this talk as a result of using pandas to try and do drill down for um, uh, all of the financial trades that my business does at uh, JP Morgan. It was millions of trades, and we were trying to give a real-time drill down to individual assets making up those trades, the, um, for financial instruments, the tenor, the, the date into the future when, uh, when they expire, and uh, all kinds of other aspects. And we were trying to produce a um, real-time sort of slice and dice studio for people to use. Um, and we needed it to respond in, in real time for that. And we wanted all calculations to be done locally on, on someone's PC, and we found that by pushing pandas, by understanding the NumPy core of it and using sensible decisions about data types, we could actually take what had been a problem that needed to run on a cluster and would take several minutes to compute would actually run in real time in a couple of seconds on a, on a local PC. Um, understanding how to do that is something that took a lot of uh, sort of pain along the way and frustration. And uh, the result of that was me wanting to turn it into a tutorial to help other people that are heading down the same, same track. 
If all you're doing is, is um, problems that involve a few thousand rows, it doesn't matter how you do it. Computers are fast enough and, and everything will be fine. But as you scale up to millions of rows, then you have a very different set of, of problems. So this is the end of the first part of the talk. Um, and we'll move to the uh, Dask data frames part next um, and give you a sense of how Pandas works if we do calculations in a distributed way. So that's in the, the next um, PDF slides. If there are any just questions now about this section uh, as I switch over, there was someone here who had a question. Yeah. So it, uh, it tries to avoid, when, so, so, okay, so, so the, the previous talk said that um, is, Pandas is taking a copy, um, and I've just said that it doesn't. Um, now, the, for as many um, operations as, as possible when you are um, uh, uh, so doing selections from a data frame, then pandas will try not to copy. It will try to use a reference to the underlying data um, as far as possible. But then when you reach an operation that really needs that data to be consolidated together in, uh, in the block manager, then it will then make a copy because it needs to consolidate that. So, there are, so it does eventually make a copy um, depending on the operation that you're doing but you can also um, just be operating on the underlying data. It's, it, it gives a warning when it thinks you're doing something wrong, but it's not obvious. It, it tries to be efficient, but there are traps there. Yeah, so if I'm writing a really long uh, piece of code, and if I want to test which, uh, which part of code is really uh, taking so much of time, yeah. Rather than working on time it function for each and every piece of code, is there any other suggestion that I could do so that I'll, I'll have an intuition so this part of code is really taking time, so I sure. need to focus on this one? So I mean, there's, there's a general profiling code that will, will let you see where the most time is being spent. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's, I mean, this is a really you know, application-specific question as well. Uh, we don't have that much time left, so I can talk to you uh, more after if, if, um, if you don't mind. So the, this uh, next um, part of the talk is to give you a flavor of what happens if we want to scale up our pandas calculations to uh, bigger problems. And this is using a library called Dask. Um, I guess some of you have heard of Dask. Any people have heard of it? Anyone used it? Okay. So um, Dask uh, aims to be a uh, drop-in replacement for certain aspects of Pandas data frames. It operates in a very different way. Um, sometimes that won't work for you, but if it does, then it can um, give you uh, benefits of working on much larger data sets with very few changes to your underlying code. The example I'm going to use here is American um, flight data, the on-time performance flight data. It's a, a monthly data set, and um, each one has about 450,000 rows. Uh, there was a, a poster competition run by the American Statistical Society uh, back in 2009 using this data. Uh, and this was the winning entry that uh, I'm just going to highlight one portion of it. This is a bunch of years showing the on-time performance day by day through the year. So that's 52 little columns there, seven days a week. Uh, each one of these blocks is a year. And you see on-time performance gets worse in summer holidays, gets worse over winter. Um, and um, uh, then I think here is a, I think probably a recession. So our analysis goal is to produce something similar to that. The, um, 
The data comes as CSV files. We can read it in using standard pandas, just like this here, just taking the first four rows and uh, displaying it transposed so it's easier to, to see on the screen. And it shows uh, for, for every day uh, the flight numbers and then for various aspects of the flight, um, departure time, takeoff time, delays, the number of minutes, taxiing, and so on. Now, we want to do this for a whole range of months, not just one individual month. If we read in one month like this, then it's taking about seven seconds and it's using a total of 740 megabytes, which is quite a lot of memory. So let's be a bit more ambitious. We take in three months and read in those three pandas data frames, use read CSV, and then concatenate them. And we find that this seven seconds has gone up to uh, more than a minute and we're using 2.3 gig. Now, that's, that's not great, and it's especially not scalable as we go through all the different months in this, um, this data set. Now, this raises a number of different issues. One is the data storage format. CSV isn't great. Um, maybe uh, uh, something that's closer to a machine format is better. Um, so we'll look at using Parquet. Uh, there are a whole lot of other different formats for that. Um, we'd want to be able to load the data in parallel. The type of calculations we also want to do in parallel using multiple cores or, or multiple machines. Um, but we don't want to put any more work into making it right. And we still want to be able to do that using pandas. And so one solution to this is this library called Dask. And uh, so if you want to know what Dask means, the official answer is it doesn't mean anything. It was just a short word that wasn't used by any other project. So um, that's, that's the official word on it. Um, so we can uh, read in uh, with a Dask data frame uh, here. We can read in a CSV file. We need to do, uh, give it a little bit more information about the structure of the data for that to work efficiently. And um, then when we read it in, it's actually read in in 18 milliseconds. Uh, so this is reading in the data, it's selecting some columns from the 109 columns. We've got three of them. We've done a, a group by, and then we've summed them up. And that's done in 18 milliseconds. Isn't that fantastic? Um, that, that's pretty amazing, I think. And that's pretty amazing because it's not actually doing that. Um, there's one final step in order to get that. In, in Pandas, we would have got the answer there. Um, but in Dask, we need to do one final step, which is to compute it. And that's now taking nine seconds. But the result that we get from that is what we would expect if we were doing it straight from pandas. So we've done a very simple calculation. It's used one, effectively one line of code, and um, it's, it's been relatively efficient. Now, to understand what's actually gone on here when this returned in, in just a few milliseconds is that uh, expressions like this are best thought of as a task rather than as a calculation. And so the task here, we can visualize the task, and we end up with a dependency graph of the steps. Uh, this is too small to read, but effectively, this has got the three separate monthly files, and then a process to read them all in, and do a group by, and then it merges the group by results, and then you get your one single result uh, at the end. Uh, that's what the, the compute function executes all this and gives us the result back. If we do this with many months. We can use wildcards here, and it will find all of them and automatically produce a dependency graph, and that's just there. That's a really, really simple way to get parallelization. And uh, if, it's, uh, if we tell it where the data is indexed, so here one field is indexed, uh, and we want just a particular date range, then it 
can actually prune the graph before it executes it. So it knows it just needs to execute this one path, and all of that, that part of it can be thrown away. So it's also more efficient in doing large-scale calculations. So, so Dask is the library that we use to do this. CSV is not a great format. Uh, a better format is Parquet. And that um, includes some indexing information and also stores things with each column separately. So uh, we can um, uh, we'll set up or um, we'll save the data in a Parquet format and then uh, read it in directly like this. We can say which columns we want. With, um, with CSV, we're reading the whole of the file. With Parquet, we just get the, the subset of columns, and so that's, um, that's relatively fast. Doing the group by and sum it and computing it. Previously, it took seven seconds um, to do that for one month. Uh, now we can do it on the whole data set in 300 milliseconds for, for all the different months. Plot it directly uh, using matplotlib in a Jupyter Notebook, and we can see the number of um, cancelled flights um, by day over a seven-year period. And that, that took a third of a second. So that shows the right library plus a good data format plus um, not reading in the data that, uh, that you don't need for your calculation is, is far more efficient. Um, this ex example is selecting a subset of the dates for doing that. And if we visualize the graph, then it's able to prune off um, most of what's being read and just return one section there. And uh, just to try and get something that looks like the uh, closer to the um, example diagram with the shaded heat map, um, pandas can, can now do um, gradients in a, um, in a data frame. And so this is, uh, this is how you set that up. Very simple to do um, and quick and easy. So. That's a distributed calculation. Very quickly before we finish, um, just show you how you can monitor the progress of that. There are a number of tools. One is a, a simple progress bar that has a, a text thing that moves along and uh, shows you when the calculation is 100% complete. Uh, it also has profilers for what's happening over time, for the memory that's used and, and so on. Uh, and that looks like this. And in this case, we have four processes running in parallel to do the parallel calculation. And this shows the various stages that they're going at through to getting the end result um, and uh, the, the memory usage for that. Um, uh, I've just got a couple of minutes left. Won't really go into what is a, a Dask data frame beyond saying it's like a pandas table with the column um, structure from, from, the, um, from the pandas data frame. And then the rows um, describes how the underlying data is partitioned in the low-level storage. And then it uses that to split up the calculation um, with uh, um, low-level uh, pandas operations. The, the tasks themselves are a bit like you know, abstract syntax trees or maybe S expressions in Lisp uh, stored as, as Python dictionaries. And this gives the instructions for a scheduler of which of these tasks to execute in which order. Uh, so they're dependent on other ones. Um, it has re-implementation, sort of lazy re-implementations of a lot of the pandas methods so that it can prune the graph and not calculate the things that it doesn't need to. Um, and then uh, computing the graph is effectively running a function to say, get us the answer needed of, of that graph. Uh, there's a scheduler that does that with different schedulers that will either work on a, on a local computer or in a cluster or in various other distributed ways. Um, but it's, it's really nice and neat. It's really simple code, actually, when you look at it. There's not very many lines of code there to achieve all that. 
And if, uh, if this can solve um, your problems for doing data calculations on a scale that are a bit too big for native pandas, then it can enable you to just uh, keep working with bigger and bigger data sets. There's some rough edges because it re-implements sections of pandas, but it doesn't re-implement all of it in a lazy way, and so some things are a bit unexpected. And also, doing distributed operations, they have very different costs. So when you are doing mergers of, of data or indexing in tricky ways, uh, that, that can be quite slow. But that, that's intrinsic to, to working in a distributed way. For some of the stuff that I do at work, I'm starting to use this on a bigger and bigger scale and really testing out how this will work in um, clusters uh, when you have multiple sets of um, work going on at the same time. Um, so that, that's my uh, next goal with this. But um, that's an introduction to Dask. I hope that's whetted your appetite to try it for um, larger analytical tasks. All of the code to do this is, is there in the sample um, notebooks on my GitHub repo. So, thank you very much. We have time for one or two questions. Um, nice talk. How does Dask compare to Flask? Uh, sorry, to, to Spark, for example. So, if you have like really big data, yeah, basically. So I, I think there are differences in terms. Yeah, Dask tries to build the whole of the graph at at the start before it goes. Um, Spark is you know, much more pushing um, computations further down. Uh, I think the um, yeah. Uh, in practice, I, I don't have enough experience with what is going to work best with each. Um, at work now, we have about five or so different cluster technologies that are being used. And so I'll be doing more benchmarking of how things really do, uh, do work differently in practice. Thanks. The, the Dask um, documentation does have uh, um, a bit of a description of the differences in how the workload is generated in PySpark versus Dask, if you want to look at that in more detail. 